Dixon. I'll be your host for tonight. And tonight we have with us uh, Kong Hao uh, on the Market Talk series uh, to share with us a bit more about the current market situation. So allow me just go through my slides. Um, some of you may already uh, know that this series of education uh, is under the Learn from the Pros series of uh, education uh, brought to you by CGSI. Uh, and we have been featuring market experts, uh, professionals on the market to come to share with us their uh, expert knowledge and experience uh, from the markets. Uh, we had uh, Mr. Ho Sing Fu, uh, with Maizel with CGS, uh, but currently independent right now, uh, that shared with us last year. Uh, we are hoping to get him in again uh, later part of the year or next year uh, to share with us his uh, trading uh, methodology uh, called Super Stocks. And we have uh, our own uh, market analyst, uh, Mr. Chua Weiren. Uh, who does the Charting Market series of webinars. And uh, you'll be happy to know that he's doing one session next week, sorry, next month uh, in June, uh, on the 27th of June to be specific. And he will be touching on building a systematic trading strategy that we all can use uh, easily from uh, technical analysis. So if you are interested in that, do... Uh, register in advance. I will share with you the link so that you can actually register for this webinar and log it into your calendar for next month. So let me just share the link first. All right, the link is in the chat box. Uh, so basically, he will be sharing with us a simple and non-discretionary trading approach that will remove emotions from the trading equation, which is very, very uh, common challenge that we all have. You know, when we buy we, and we are in a losing trade, we tend not to want to cut loss and sell. So how do we actually have a simple and yet effective uh, systematic trading methodology to go through our portfolio? Uh, that's where we will come in and share with us how he does it uh, from his perspective. So uh, do register for this uh, webinar if you are interested. And with that done, I'll come back to today's webinar. Uh, today, we will be having Market Talk by Kong Hao. And the topic for today will be US market mayhem, panic or opportunity. So over the last one to two months, we have seen the volatility in the US market. So what does all that mean? And what does all that mean also to the Singapore investor if we want to invest in the Singapore uh, market? So I'm um, looking forward to hear from Kong Hao what he has to say. And just a series of uh, short disclaimer. So do bear in mind that whatever we present tonight is for educational purposes only. And it's not an indication or recommendation to trade or invest uh, in any asset. So for any trading or investment, do do your due diligence and check with your financial uh, brokers and uh, financial advisors. And we, of course, would love to have questions for tonight. So uh, any questions you have, do feel free to key in the Q&A box on Zoom. We will come to them uh, towards the end of the session. And if you wish to ask questions directly, as in uh, speak out and ask questions, you're more than welcome to just click on the raise hand icon and I can unmute you and you can speak uh, to uh, Kong Hao. I also bear in mind, I just want to uh, uh, give a perspective on the time that we have. Uh, uh, we have until 8.30 or so to uh, for the session to end. Uh, if there are more questions, we may actually extend a little bit towards uh, maybe 10 to 15 minutes after 8.30. So, um, but do uh, pardon us if we cannot answer all the questions by the time frame because we want to also uh, be very strict about timing. So, uh, but do uh, put in your questions, okay? Uh, if really, really uh, you can't get your question answered, uh, there'll be uh, feedback uh, later on and also uh, 
post webinar, we'll be sending you out, uh, sending out to you uh, a Zoom uh, email as well, so you can always reach out to us again. So with that out of the way, I'd like to bring Kong Hao to the stage. Uh, as all of you know, Kong Hao is a very, very experienced market professional, uh, initially from the buy side and now on the independent advisor. So he was on the buy side, sell side, and also now an independent market analyst. And uh, very, very uh, latest news is that he has been also awarded uh, a trading wizard from Trading View uh, platform. And there are only three uh, awardees uh, globally. So uh, it, it really speaks a lot uh, on his credential. And uh, he's only Singaporean, I believe, that is uh, one of the three winners. So maybe Kong Hao can share a little bit more about that uh, later, but uh, it's up to him. So without the way, I'd like to uh, invite Kong Hao to come on stage and uh, just share with us his view on the US market and also the Singapore market. So Kong Hao, please. Yeah, thank you, Nixon, for the wonderful introduction. And of course, uh, welcome all to attend for today's uh, webinar. Okay, let me just quickly check on the uh, my PowerPoint. Okay, I hope you are seeing the, uh, the main slides. So today yes. I'll be presenting on the market topic. And I think many of us may have forgotten that, in fact, the month of April, the US market actually uh, sell down quite a bit. But, you know, most of us investors and traders, we are very forgetful, including myself. So, but we have forgotten about it because in this month of May and today's uh, uh, last two trading day of May, the market have kind of re rebounded. Yeah. So we're going to discuss about such a great volatility over the last, last two months. What does it imply? Um, I think the, in 2020, everything changes because of inflation. And this inflation, uh, problem is going to stay with us for a long time. Yeah, this is not just according to what I see, but even our ministers will say that they hinted to us that the we have to live with inflation for a longer period of time. Yeah, so it's not going to go away that easily. And I would say that Singapore, we have managed inflation very well. Uh, one of the key reasons is because we have a strong Sing dollar. So let me just bring through the topic that I'll be discussing tonight. And today I'm going to discuss about um, yes, inflation started to kick in. In June 2022, the US inflation hit a high of 9%. And then today is still around there because for the last one whole year, the inflation US is hang around 3%, not going down to 2% target. So we're going to discuss that. And April this year is sent me a very strong signal that uh, the market is very sensitive to inflation. When I say the market, of course, I'm referring to the US market. And Singapore market are generally quite small. So US market, when they move with the kind of magnitude of volatility, we also have to be concerned that how would that impact us. But I think the key topic towards the end, I will discuss about how to navigate into Singapore market. I think I have a good news. On the US side, not so good news. It may seem rosy. But on the Asia side, especially ASEAN, and especially Singapore, I have good news. Later, I'll share with you why. And then we're going to recap the previous webinars last year. In fact, I started doing this series uh, two years ago with uh, CGS. And uh, we're going to just do a recap what we've been uh, sharing about. So have it come to pass, we're going to share with that. Um, and then we're going to study about the current market pulse, what's happening, especially April, just last month onwards. Something has, has just happened. And then, of course, the key topic tonight is that how can we navigate Singapore market in the storm that already started two years ago? And uh, I definitely welcome all your questions. Uh, so that's uh, the my my forte is really into uh, behavior science. That means I like to connect dots, different markets to make sense of uh, the key thing, which is investment, not just in Singapore, but uh, whatever that's uh, keen to me that... Uh, I think there's a potential for a uh, greater trend to come, which I believe that Singapore is the next one to move. Uh, I know that India has moved, Japan has moved, uh, but Asia, many have not moved yet. China have not moved, Singapore have not moved, but I believe the time will come. Okay, So I'm going to share with you later on. So um, 
I enjoy doing all this behavior science study and uh, tonight going to apply what we've learned to the Singapore market as well. So earlier, uh, Nixon shared about, uh, I received this uh, Trading View Wizard Award, which uh, it came as a surprise to me. I have no idea what is a Trading View until I go and Google it. And I just felt so privileged at, on the 3rd of May. And for the whole month, is uh, just sweetness. Uh, even when I sleep, I think about it. And when I wake up, I also uh, wake up with a smile. I think we'll just continue for the next one month or two. Uh, but it's definitely a recognition that uh, I think all my partners have uh, given me the opportunity, like CGS, to train me with all this time of uh, uh, hours to speak. It kind of attributes to uh, the award that I received. So, but anyway, I think the key topic is what I'm going to deliver here tonight. Um, so what I'm going to present to you here is uh, based on what I understand and for my own consumption. So definitely after today's presentation, if you felt that whatever I say makes sense, you want to get into action, say tomorrow is a Friday, uh, please consult your broker, CGS. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about April inflation, US inflation. Now, let's study about this US inflation chart here. Um, so COVID started in 2022. So now something happened here is that uh, I would say that COVID is just a switch of an underlying problem that all the while the world have, which is inflation, are uh, being suppressed to about 2%. Already have this inflation problem, but somehow I think the global central bank are doing a fabulous job. They managed to suppress it at about 2% that we could see, right? Now, COVID became a switch because the supply chain is one of the events that the inflation kind of uh, get out of this uh, gate, you know. It's, uh, <laughs> the little devil just came out and it hit the half of 9%. And that was the period of time. That's why I say in June 2022, everything changes. And how we're going to invest in the near future and the far future is also depend on the inflation globally. Now, and you still remember in June 2022 when inflation hit a half 9% in the US, what did the US Fed did was that they increased a series of, I think about four 75 basis points. I can't remember exactly how many times, but uh, that was many times of 75 basis points. So we managed to bring down the inflation to 3% as we could see. Now from 9 to 3%, which is a good news because with a high inflation is bad news. High inflation means that interest rate will rise and it's definitely not good news for stock market because most of the listed company have borrowings. With high interest rate, they will have to pay uh, much more repayment and that will eat up to, your, to their net profit. But what I'm going to point out to you here is that it hit the low of 3% in June 2023. And this stagnated of 3% has been ongoing for the last one whole year. <laughs> it's already one year by now that inflation is not coming down to 2% at all. It's staying at 3%. Now, I want to let you point out to you how sensitive the market is with inflation with just about 0.1 point movement or 0.2 point movement on inflation. Now, so this is the S&P chart. And S&P is really pretty gentle. But if you look at NASDAQ, it was pretty fierce during the April sell-down. Now, let me explain to you what happened to the April sell-down. This is the CPI index in Feb. Of course, the February CPI, only one month later, you will release on the 12th of March. And the CPI data was at 3.2. Now, let's look at the March CPI. The March CPI released on the 10th of April. From 3.2, it uptake by 0.3%. And just a little up move, it sends a lot of fear to the market. Now, so earlier I mentioned that the inflation for you have been stagnated for a year. So this was a little uptick here from 3.2 to 3.5. And what happened to the market was because of this little uptake and the investor are fearful that could it be uh, inflation making a U-turn up? Yeah, because if you make a U-turn up, it means that the US Fed fund or rather central bank will not cut the interest rate or maybe if continue to stay firm for the inflation they may continue to hike the interest rate, which just now we discussed, it is a bad news for most of the company, including individuals with heavy borrowings. And we could see that because of this move, the market sell off. And because of the 
April number, which published on the 15th May, that was about two weeks ago, the market also kind of rebounded. You can see that how sensitive the market is because of inflation. So do look out for the coming inflation data from time to time. And what you can do is just Google CPI inflation schedule. You're able to know when the CPI is going to release. Uh, of course, all these charts are easily available. You can just go and Google it. You'll find all these charts available. So I'm just going to point to you how sensitive the market is with CPI. Just a 0.3% uh, uptake, the market move. Just a 0.1% down move, the market move up. Yeah. So we have to live with this for... Uh, it's very inconvenient, but uh, we I, I guess uh, that's what sharing is all about. And uh, we, we share ideas and hopefully we learn from each other. And I'm going to share with you what how I position my trade. But let me just describe to you over the last two years what was my mandate that given the platform with CGS uh, here to share. And over the last two years, what I share on the latest one was 29 Feb. But generally, over the last two years, uh, I share about three opportunities. But let's talk about the three risks first in end of uh, last year and beginning of this year. So basically, for this year, beginning of this year, is that the three risks that I'm seeing here is number one, is still the geopolitical tension. Number two, with geopolitical tension, it will uh, uh, lead to supply chain. Uh, intensify the supply chain issue that inflation will pick up. Yeah. So then number three is a recession, which is uh, I think many of us uh, kind of uh, laugh at the economists because most of the economists say that recession will come in 2023, but 2023 have passed. There's no recession. But I, I have to stand on the side of the economists. Why? Because they are not wrong that recession uh, will come. It's just that they didn't get a timing Correct. So beginning of this year, what I share was that my concern is that there's an expansion of geopolitical tension. And we know that uh, this chart here, uh, what happened here is November, the Houthis harassed the ship and then the ship from Asia or export or we export to Europe, we have to pass through this Swiss canal. So it's like a shortcut or the export from European nation, the export product to Asia they have to pass through the Swiss Canal. But in November, last year, when the Houthis uh, harassed the ship, most of the ship, 60 to 70%, reroute to the South Africa. And this kind of, uh, this reroute increased the shipment days by about 10 days to about two weeks. And for this increase, every ship vessel have to pay a lot of fees up to about a few hundred thousand dollars, depending on the size of the shipment. Of course, when it cost increase, is it lead to because of the expansion of tension, it lead to uh, then begin of this year is that my concern is that we got to keep track of whether the inflation is going to U-turn. Not yet, but you are seeing that very soon. Yeah, and of course the recent last two months, Iran also participated. Thankfully, it did not escalate further. And the latest strike on the Gaza Strip, uh, one of the Egyptian Egypt soldier was being killed. So I hope that uh, that will not uh, create any more tension. Yeah, if there's more tension, it will just lead to uh, more supply chain issue. When there's more supply chain issue, inflation, uh, we've got to make a good guess here is that we uptake more or downtake towards 2%. But my guess is that I think the uptake is more possible than the downtake. Yeah, but inflation, as we could see, has been staying there for 3% for one year by now. So recession, uh, maybe I'm not going to talk about it, uh, may not come this year, but we're going to study it anyway later on. And the three opportunities that I share over the last two years and in February this year is pretty consistent. Uh, US market, basically, I enjoy trading them. And basically, when you see a lot of opportunity, uh, you trade them. So we see the up and down move of the US market. So it's quite... Uh, nice to trade or maybe you can invest in them. But when I say trade, uh, my time frame of holding them is not that long as well. So once it hit a certain percentage gain, uh, don't be too greedy on the US market. Just be willing to cash out if you can. So commodities over the last two years is quite straightforward. Uh, basically, my mandate is to buy the gold. Yeah, because I would say that gold is the leader of the rest of the commodities. As long as gold stay firm, the rest of the commodities 
should be move, moving up. And for Asian market over the last two years that I've advocated to accumulate them, and over the last two years, you see that the Japanese market started to move up, Indian market started to move up, but not yet for the China and Singapore market and the ASEAN market. But I think soon, yeah, so we're going to wait and see. And uh, so this is what we have discussed over the last two years. And Fab, I can't do a recap, but now I'm doing a recap of what they shared. Now, let's go over to the current market pulse. Now, something an unusual behavior that I saw, and over the last few weeks, Berkshire Hathaway have their AGM. And then, um, of course, they, they did mention, and but uh, even no AGM, all of us can see here, is that for Warren Buffett company, Berkshire Hathaway, for the first time in history, they have reached close to 190 billion US dollars cash on hand. Yeah. And compared to his market cap at about 900 billion, close to 900 billion. So you just take about 190 divided by 900 billion. It means that they have a cash reserve of 22% not investing. Now, my question is this that an investment company like Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett, that keeping so much cash and not investing. Now, it is supposed to be an investment company, but they are keeping cash and not investing it. So, and it's not just Berkshire Hathaway, but many large cap stocks in the United States are holding a lot of cash reserve. So I have to look at this. Um, I have to, as, a, as an investor, it's not just me, you all can do it, is that you have to position your the mindset as the ass. What are they doing? So, of course, I didn't talk to Warren Buffett, but I think I know his thoughts. Yeah, We, we all can get into his mind. You are having an investment company, but most of the investment company, they will have cash, but they will quickly uh, dispatch it out for investment. But this time around, what he did was he hold a lot of cash. And I could only sum up two key points here, is that why are all these large cap stock holding so much cash and not reinvesting or throw money back to their R&D uh, to expand their company. I think the two key reasons is, number one, is that they're not seeing good investment opportunity ahead. They have no idea. Okay, so, And number two, of course, uh, we know about this uh, saying that cash is king. During tough time, it's good to have a lot of cash. Yeah. So these are the two key reasons that I believe uh, why uh, companies like Berkshire Hathaway are keeping so much cash reserve, not investing. They're supposed to invest, but they're not investing much. And then uh, number two is that they're preparing for a tougher time. Now, let me just get to the next slides here. Is Let's talk about the GDP. And what we're looking at here is the quarter to quarter GDP. Um, now, let me just macro it so we can see uh, an, a nicer picture of uh, the volatility of the GDP quarter to quarter that very obviously you could see a downtrend of the, this GDP. And so what happened here is that during the GDP is being taken by quarter by quarter. So the half year of last year, it was nearing five, as you could see here. Okay, And then uh, third quarter, it was somewhere around 3.5. And then during the last quarter of last year, it is 1.6. Now, we have to note this down very clearly is that from five, half a year to about 1.6, that is a very steep drop. And generally, if you see over the last 2021, after the uh, uh, COVID, uh, the GDP in US, we could see generally is a downtrend. So what I'm trying to say earlier is that uh, the most economies are not wrong that they say that recession will come. Uh, it's just that they got the timing not too accurate. Yeah, so it may come later, but not 2023. Maybe next year, I do not know. But this is something that we have to be very concerned. We have to understand what the big boys are thinking. Why are they hoarding so much cash? Okay, what are they thinking? They are concerned that market may move up. The CPM may move up. Let me just give you some data point here, like what Jerome Powell always like to say. Uh, a lot of reporters keep on asking him, when are you cutting the interest rate? But he will, I can almost uh, phrase for him. Uh, I listened to so many of his conference that he will say, definitely say that we were going to look at the totality of the incoming data. 
uh, meeting by meeting, then we'll decide then and then. That's what he would usually say. When he said the totality of all this incoming data is not just CPI, um, let me just give you some idea here that uh, the raw commodity prices, the cattle prices um, traded in one of the exchange here is at its all-time high right now. Cattle prices means that those who enjoy uh, beef, rib eye steak, saloon steak, red meat is at its all-time high. This one just broke the all-time historical high. A rice is still at the historical, uh, around the historical high. And what I saw that the soybean, uh, soybean meals, uh, soybean oil, uh, these are very important product because the meat that we eat, eat the soybean meals, these uh, commodities use the meals to, to feed all these animals. These are animal feeds. Um, so all this soybean oil, this month itself have kind of, uh, imagine the soybean meal. So it kind of stagnated from here. But this might itself be kind of a push up quite strongly. And I would say that uh, now it's 30th of May. It closed, can I, I would say that it almost closed very firm. And so is the wheat, you know, wheat uh, for Asia, we take the rice, but in the West, they look at the wheat prices because wheat are used to make all the bread. So the wheat for this month itself in month of May, it also went up quite a bit. Yeah. So now all this data, these are data, uh, it will take some weeks to be calculated and uh, uh, it, uh, be tabulated as a CPI. So everything will have some delay effect, but i uh, just going to share with you some little tricks here is that you also look at the raw data price as well. So all these are the raw data price. So I believe that if you're going to ask me where will be the CPI going to be in the next uh, few, one or two months to come, I think likely looking at the raw commodity prices, likely the uptake should be there. That's what I'm seeing here. And again, let me just bring you back to what are this Berkshire Hathaway, uh, all these big boys, the very familiar name in uh, NASDAQ, Dow Jones and S&P, the top 10 companies. Why are they hoarding so much cash? Uh, number one is that they are not seeing much investment opportunity around moving forward. And number two, they are seeing tougher time ahead. Now, why I say so is that earlier we study about GDP is coming down. And there's a risk that inflation may move up. Yeah. Now, when these two combinations happen, inflation move up and growth come down. So you may be asking, how could it be possible that when growth start to decline, then things still will get very expensive? There's reason behind it. But the thing is that the data is at this. Is, it is what it is. And the risk is inflation may move up. If GDP also move down, it means stagflation. And that is the worst among all. Yeah, so uh, it's the two combination of very little uh, data, you get stagflation. Now, and what I'm seeing here, uh, this is the last slide on the US market. Why we study US market? Because it's the big market, it will impact the rest of the market. But this time around, I'm seeing there should have some opportunity for the ASEAN, especially ASEAN, Asia, and especially ASEAN country. So later, I'm going to share with you just uh, 10 minutes before this uh, webinar, I read some news. Uh, I heard over the radio, but I just want to read again just to confirm what I've heard is correct. Now, what I'm going to share with you here is um, we got to look at the big boys. So earlier, these uh, top 10 companies that I share with you are mainly in you find Dow Jones, S&P, and NASDAQ. But for the US company, not to forget that there are thousands of companies out there. Most of them belong to this group called the Russell 2000. They are the mid-sized company. And you look at the trend, in fact, since about 2023, in fact, it's very uncertain. And I suspect that uh, likely it will go down for the mid-sized company. Now, why is this important? Because we have to look at the US mass consumer. Now, who is the US mass consumer? And we know that uh, US have this ecosystem that uh, they have big companies, but they also have spenders, the mass consumer like to spend uh, to support all these listed company. Indirectly, they are not aware, but unconsciously are not aware, but this is, it is what it is. Now, what I'm concerned here is that because the Russell 2000 also represents those uh, mid-size or small cap stocks in the United States, not even listed, but is a good representation of all these mid to small size company. Where I believe that the Russell 2000 
and all the SME in the United States also employ the largest workforce in the United States. And who are these people employed? They are the mass consumer of the United States. Now, if the Russell are not doing well, and unlike the S&P, Dow Jones, and NASDAQ, we saw all these companies, they all these companies don't have a lot of cash reserve. So when interest rate move up, they are the ones that suffer the most. So I would say that if Russell 2000 suffer, it also means that, can I say that the employee, who is also the mass consumer of the United States, will tighten their belts to use or buy the service in all these products. Yeah, so it makes sense, right? So uh, I have a new topic called the Russell is a leading indicator to the big boys, which is, um, you think about it, I think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Now, I'm going to move on to Singapore market. So you could see that there's some risk. Like what I said earlier, just to give you some recap here, is that since uh, June 2022, when the inflation of the United States hit the high of 9%, things will not be the same again moving forward. Everything is going to revolve around inflation. Yeah, Unless inflation can get down to 2% in a very sustained manner, uh, not too volatile, uh, but what uh, the Jerome Powell is not saying that inflation failed to move down 2%, but there's a risk that it may make a U-turn. And based on the raw data price that I just shared with you, I think the likelihood is more towards upside than downside. And let's look at Asia market. Now, Singapore market is the broker of the world. So especially for ASEAN and Asia, if ASEAN and Asia do well, we should do well as well. Let me just describe to you what I see in Singapore market. And very importantly is the strong Sing dollar. Now, a lot of us uh, have the wrong concept that US dollars are very strong. Uh, in fact, I'm not seeing US dollars very strong. Uh, of course, if you're going to compare our US dollars to the emerging nations, the US dollar seems very strong. But if you're going to compare to a developed nation like US and a developed nation like Singapore or Swiss, in fact, the US dollars have dropped quite a bit over the last 40 years. Dollar Swiss, it was 1.4 and today it's 0 0.9. So it means that US dollars have dropped by four times. So Sing dollars, also the same. In 1985, if you travel to US, you will have to pay about two Sing dollars to exchange one US dollars. Today is at 1.3. So it means that the US dollars is weakened against the Sing, but the Sing dollar is stronger. Now, one of the key reasons for Singapore to manage inflation is that I believe that we should manage inflation pretty well. And inflation, global inflation, is something that we cannot avoid. Yeah, because we're part of the whole ecosystem. We can't avoid the global inflation, but we do can manage. Uh, thankfully, we have strong Sing dollar. And then number one is that the there's a grow, growing trend in tourism. So this is something that you may want to take a look at. And the growth is not fantastic, but half growth is better than no growth. So MAS know that the challenge of the world out there in the next two or three years to come, but yet for... This year, they set the growth target to 1.1 to 2-3%. It's not so bad yeah, for Singapore. So number three is that we have the strong Sing dollar. Now let's look at, um, this is an article uh, about uh, uh, more than half a year, but it's still relevant today. Now, that's what JP Morgan say that Singapore is a safe haven in difficult global environment. And I'm saying that because there's a lot of fun flows that's coming in. Uh, this year in 2024 and they should remain the stand uh, why because this year I saw a lot of fun flow although this is what being said last year now let's look at uh, one last slide before we talk about some trading strategy or investment strategy for Singapore market with uh, a challenge that is uh, outside of Asia yeah there's a big challenge out there but I think Asia we should do pretty well now to scan across Asia uh Again, Singapore is a broker uh, to the whole world. And especially if ASEAN do well, we will do well. Now for East Asia growth, it's projected to be 4.4%. But the global average growth is about 27 So you could see that the ASEAN are doing uh, exceptionally well moving forward, 4.4%. And let's look at the large economy. Of course, the largest economy is US, followed by China, Japan number three, 
uh, German number four, I think, and India number five. Yeah, definitely German is number four. And South Korea may think that the economy is huge, but it's ranked number 12. Then how about if I'm going to uh, amalgamate all the ASEAN country to fit into the world power, we actually are not too bad. Fourth or fifth largest economy in the whole world. Yeah. And let me just look at what happened here for this year. Now, the foreign direct investment, 50% of the global foreign direct investment is coming into Asia. The whole world is very big, but 50% are flowing into Asia. And 70% of the, uh, that's 70% of the world growth and growth potential, uh, infrastructure projects, uh, basically Asia, we, because of the, and especially for ASEAN, and we learned our mistake from the Asia crisis in 1997. So there's this economic maturity today and our population are also much more educated. And I'm just going to share with you this uh, slides, the last slide before we get into the technical side of things. And then we'll move into the Q&A. Is that um, this is what I received from SGX in the email mailers that SDI booked 500 million year to date net institutional flow just on the banks itself. Yeah, you could see that uh, there's a lot of institutional uh, flow coming into the banking sector uh, for the first uh, up to 23rd of May. So that's uh, pretty encouraging to see that there's fund flow coming into Singapore and buying up the banking sector here. And let's look at the technical part. And earlier I say that there are three opportunities uh, over the last two years when I share with uh, CGS is that uh, number one is that I would love to trade the US market because it's very volatile. It means that when I say trade, uh, I will get into the market and I will don't have a very long-term projection, maybe not going to hold for more than two years. Uh, if there's profit, good profit, I will take. If I'm wrong, if it move on the downside, I'm willing to cut loss as well. So that's what I mean by trading in the US market. For the commodities, I would love to buy and hold them since about two and a half years ago, I would say that. And I think I've waited for uh, less than two years. So finally, for the gold market this year, it started to perform very well, where I believe that market will continue to move. And for Asia market, and of course, uh, my heart is always in Singapore market, is that what we're seeing here, uh, where I draw a trend line very clear, uh, is that since the 90s until today, can you see that there's a wedge and over the, uh, since the uh, uh, 2008, before the 08 crisis, this was a high. And over this period, over the last uh, 20 years, the market has tried to breach this 3004 numerous times. But you could see that it's consolidating. So therefore, I didn't say buy into Asia or buy into Singapore. Over the last two years, I say this very clearly, is that I accumulate Asia. When I say on my personal mandate, when I say buy, it means that I'm confident that market will move up pretty fast. Uh, when I say accumulate, means that I see value, but I do not see there's much of the downside risk. Uh, therefore, I accumulate. But when should we buy into the Singapore market as we continue to accumulate technically is what, I, this is what I'm seeing here. That we could see that in behavioral science study on this Singapore market STI alone, that throughout the last 20 years, that market trying to breach, it did breach, but it kind of failed, uh, 3004. Now, every, any time frame, this is a quarterly chart. Any quarter, if you give me a very nice closing that convincingly closed above 3004, then I would expect that uh, maybe there'll be, I do not know, I, I cannot give you a time frame. If in time to come, uh, I'm not going to give you a time frame yeah, because uh, I do not know until the market performed. If any time of it, now I'm what I'm doing is that I'm interested to accumulate good stocks that pay dividend. If it don't move, it's fine, but I believe that downside are limited. If it move, it's a bonus. But once the STI start to move and close above 3004, so this will be my timing. So it gives me a very clear indicated uh, uh, move that then it's time for me to pick up more shares more seriously in the Singapore market. So this is what I do. So sometimes when we look at into, when we invest to other countries, it's always good to look at their benchmark, the index, then before we get serious into individual stocks. So that's one of the tricks that uh, when I invest locally or overseas, I look at the benchmark first to get a feel on how the market is performing. 
So as of now, you can see this wedge market indeed are consolidating. is waiting to break and bridge above 3004 and Singapore market, I know that a lot of investors say that uh, Singapore market is quite boring, uh, but Singapore market is also one of the highest dividend-paying uh, market in the whole world. Now, this is called the STI Total Return Index. And why I say that when we accumulate, we accumulate those stocks that pay good dividends. And I'm seeing limited downside. It means that you also have to buy those stocks that uh, generally are pretty healthy. Yeah? And if you're going to include... Why is this STI total return index? means that they also include the dividend payout and they compile it. means that you keep on holding to this basket of STI stock. You compile it. In fact, the chart looks like this. So over this time frame, in fact, the STI stocks are doing very well because we know that most of the time, the US stocks do not pay much interest. Yeah. So, so Singapore stocks are different. Now, um, from the last webinar that I have, I, I do have uh, some feedback here is that uh, I didn't uh, recommend any stocks. Now, you have to understand my position here is that because I'm not a stock broker and uh, I know the rules very well and the compliance that uh, I should not get into product specific. So how they come out into these 20 stocks that I have is that basically is this. You know the environment is that uh, likely inflation is going to move up. I think, let me just give you a few key here is that I betting on the Asian market that the next wave should be on the Asian market, especially for China and ASEAN. Yeah, so I'm seeing that uh, the market is going to break above. Of course, I do not know when. Uh, now I'm accumulating it. And so earlier we discussed about the risk of high inflation with higher interest rate. That one, I think likely it will still stay. Uh, of course, the worst case scenario is that the in interest rate continue to climb. And that's a bad news for stocks. And therefore, uh, the news that I read today or I come across is that the uh, beginning of this month, um, Microsoft announced that they're going to invest $2 billion uh, US dollars into the Malaysia cloud and AI, AI technology. And also Amazon also want to add on another $9 billion US dollars in Singapore uh, market as well in the similar uh, market into the AI and cloud technology. Yeah, so you can see that a lot of fund flows are coming in, yeah, big and small. Um, so, but with the understanding that interest rate may continue to climb or at least stay here or climb higher, then uh, those companies that we pick, we got to be very careful that make sure they're not, their gearing are not so high. What do you mean by gearing? Gearing means that they don't have uh, a lot of borrowings. I do not want this company to be so burdened in the context of higher interest rate environment, they have to uh, so stress to pay most of profit, have to uh, uh, feed their yeah, interest rate payment. So that's a very sad, sad case. So those companies that I pick, and uh, what I did was that I just Google, uh, you can do the same here, is that uh, because I do not want to be very specific on what are the stock pick that I have. So what I did was really is that I Google the top dividend companies in Singapore. Yeah. And this platform, I kind of like it because there's health. It means that uh, they're not too heavily geared. Don't have too much borrowings. They have borrowings, but not too heavy. But they also pay dividends. So it gives me 20 of them. So you can explore into different platform. And this is generally how I shortlist my uh, stocks. First, I have to understand the whole macro. Look at the country that I think will start to move. Then after that, I will fine-tune the... the uh, a selected few stocks that I like. So what I can do is that there are so many platforms out there. Uh, this is just one of them. So literally, I Google top dividend paying companies, listed companies in Singapore. So I happen to chance upon this website and I kind of like it because it says that uh, health is healthy and they also pay dividends. So it gives me this 20 stocks. So if you want, you can uh, uh, go back to review this video. Uh, if not, then we're going to move on to the Q&A uh, right now. And before I move on Q&A, just want to leave you some contact. Uh, so this is my YouTube channel, Facebook and Trading View, And these are my channel names. So uh, every week I will post some insight about what I've seen in the market. Uh, really enjoy doing that. Uh, then there's my website and there's my email address. So what I can do is that during Q&A, um, although I do not want to cover too much about individual stock, but I think 
I would love the challenge that you can ask me individual stocks. And what I want to do is that we can do a case study on that stocks that you uh, requested. So we see if it makes sense. But we're going to study on the technical charts and, and see how it goes. Yeah, so I will just pass this time back to Nixon. Uh, thank you, Kong Hao. So before we go into Q&A uh, segment, uh, allow me to just share my slide here. Go on while I switch the slide. All right. So uh, I think Tong Hao has given us a very good update on the current situation in the market. Uh, before I go into Q&A, uh, allow us just to uh, gather some feedback. Uh, this feedback is... Uh, Pretty important for us because your feedback, first of all, would of course uh, encourage Kong Hao to uh, bring more of such valuable insight uh, to us in the uh, coming uh, sessions. And also, of course, uh, uh, more importantly, this feedback goes to management where uh, we can actually uh, support the uh, continuation of this series of educational programs so that we can continue to bring uh, Learn from the Proofs series of education and uh, especially Kong Health uh, Market Talks series of education uh, from uh, this year as well as into next year as well. So uh, do uh, spend just a couple of minutes uh, just to fill in the feedback form uh, and then uh, we can go back to the Q&A. So allow me to just share the, the link to the feedback form here. Yeah, so I just captured that link and uh, in the interest of time, I'll just go back now to uh, Q&A. Right. So before we go into the specific question, Kong Hao, um, I have a couple of questions that uh, just came up when you were presenting on the US, right? So um, I think we all see that the US has uh, made all-time high again, <laughs> right, in the last two months. And there is, uh, as you presented, some risk to the market. So it being high uh, and there's some risk and we know that uh, uh, one buffer is also withholding a fair amount of cash. So the indication seems to be that we should be careful in the US market. So my question is, if there is a, a downturn in the US indices, wouldn't that also affect the Singapore indices in the ASEAN Asia indices as well? Because they are all quite related, aren't they? So if, if the US market falls, we, we normally will see that the Asian market will also fall. But at the same time, you're saying that there's opportunity in the Singapore uh, Asian market. So how do we balance that, that two point of view? Because there's a risk there and yet there's an opportunity there in the Asian market. Yeah, uh, Nixon, thanks for the question. I think it's a very, very good question here. Uh, I think uh, let me talk about uh, some physics here. Yeah, physics is this. Um, first of all, I think Asia, Singapore, especially ASEAN and China, we have not moved much on the upside at all. Yeah. Whereas for the US, they have moved up a lot. If I talk about a few folds, if I talk about the last uh, four decades or two decades, they've moved up by a few, four, few folds. It also means that they, if it start to turn because of the gravity, they move out a lot. Which which one do you think will fall harder? Yeah. So when it comes to investment, it's all about uh, also not forgetting about risk management. Uh, if you th therefore, I advocate that uh, you trade the U.S. market means that you have to be very nimble. When we trade, you get in, you get out fast. Yeah. So if you fall, you get out fast. Uh, but for Asia, it tends to be a bit more passive. Uh, because in the first place. We are not talking about we are getting into a high point. So yes, you are right. If the US market fall, Asia will also fall. But I think the magnitude of down move will not be that great compared to those of US. And why the big companies are accumulating a lot of cash? And let me just share with you some uh, context here is that they are making a lot of money, by the way. Okay. And just give you some perspective here. Uh, the Fed fund rate now is at 5.5%. And the two years treasury, uh, means that by the bonds, they'll give you some payout. Is at about maybe 4.9, about there. I can't be specific, but it's about there. I'll make it five. Okay. Now, so what I'm trying to say here is that all these money that they have, 
say Berkshire Hathaway, they have uh, 190 billion US dollars cash. So they're not doing, they're not investing yet, but they're buying into two years treasury that pay them 5% interest every year. So in the perspective, if you put a 1 billion US dollars in a two years fixed deposit rate, this is what exactly the big boys are doing. So a 5% return means that on a 1 billion US dollars, they're getting a 50 million dollars interest payout every year. So to them, it's very juicy. And they see that, well, since the interest rate is so high, then there's no point for me to take on greater risk out, outside. So that's one way uh, they are, but I think they're very fortunate because uh, compared to the Russell 2000 or the mid, mid-sized company, I think these companies are struggling. They don't have much cash flow. But for the big companies, I think they're quite blessed. And But uh, they are making good money. Uh, I think their stocks should be quite well. But of course, when the market turned, these stocks will also come down. Uh, but uh, compared to the Russell 2000, I think they'll come down more compared to the big boys over there. So just sidetrack a little bit, yeah. Okay, great. So so basically, the, the risk is higher in the US uh, because of the latitude yes, uh, versus the Asian market. Right. The the second question I have, uh, before we move on to the uh, the questions uh, submitted, is uh, back to the US because we know that this year is the US presidential election year, right? Uh, so, and I was just reading, I think, the forecast currently running, Donald Trump seems to be in the lead, right? Mm. Uh, so what will happen? What do you foresee will happen if Donald Trump wins the election again and become president? Okay, so thank, uh, thank you for the question as well. So I do have this uh, uh, seminar on the topic about US election and the market. So I did my research two months ago. And so in this research, what I did was, uh, before I did make this presentation, I researched into the past uh, two elections where Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, they, uh, of course, uh, fight to the, the top position. Uh, then the, the very last one, Donald Trump won, and we study about how the market react to it. Then the latest election was between Donald Trump and Biden. So Biden won, so we also have an experience of how the market react to it. So you're yeah, right, uh, based on the case study that we did, or I researched into it, uh, when Donald Trump won the time, uh, in fact, the market react very positively, uh, uh, the market went up, yeah? So it's very clear that the market like Donald Trump, based on the past case study that we have saw. And Biden, uh, when he won, the market actually came off, yeah? but. My presentation then about two months back is that we also study that regardless of whoever wins, yeah, uh, if you want to know whoever wins, how the market react based on the past case studies that Donald Trump win, the few days the market will react positively. That's what we saw. Biden, if Biden wins, the market will react negatively. Okay, but whatever, whoever president win, ultimately the US market will continue to climb. And that's historically what we what we have studied. Yeah, but it comes to a point of it is beyond the US election. It's not important to me anymore if you are talking about as an investor. Um, whether Donald Trump, Biden, the next few days just going to bring uh, much volatility. Um, but over the last 40 years is that whoever wins, the US market will go up anyway. Uh, but moving forward, we have to be very careful that what well, I just share with you, that the CPI play a very important role a 0.3% movement upwards or from 3.4, I think it's the latest number, if it ever go up to 4 and 4.2. So what kind of signal will it send to the market that the inflation is making a U-turn up? You also send a, a signal to the market that maybe the interest rate is gonna, not going to cut at all. It's going to move up. And that's not, not a good news at all for the stock market. So I think moving forward, that's why I say from the beginning is that since June 2022, the scene of investment is very different moving forward. We have to be very careful. And what we use to uh, do it correctly about passive investment may not able to apply over the next uh, many years to come if the interest rate continue to maintain at a high point. Yeah. So what we done, if you are a property investor or stock buy and hold stocks, the last 40 years you make it, is because of interest rate generally was on the downtrend. But things may not be the same moving forward. 
if the whole interest rate environment have took a turn. Yeah, so this is something that I want you to really uh, ponder upon it. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Gong. Yeah. So uh let us move quickly to the QA questions here. Uh since we are in the US, I'll just pick some of the US question uh to follow through. Um let me see. Yeah, okay. So from uh Motak. Okay, Motak King. <laughs> okay, the email is Motak King. Uh the question is. Are the Magnificent Seven worth accumulating given the pullbacks a month ago? Um, I would like to trade them. Okay, now the thing is this. If you have to identify this question is that, first of all, you have to identify when you buy the Magnificent Seven right now. Okay, I'm not talking about the past. I do not know the Magnificent Seven that you have. When do you have it? Okay, that's that's your story. But if I talk about for the rest of 61 of us here tonight is that if you're going to buy any of the Magnificent 7 today, it's at a high point. As an investor, do you want to make one bagel? Do you expect to make an, one bagel means that you make a one-fold return? Yeah, so what is the likelihood that you make one-fold return from there based on the inflation risk that I'm talking about? Yeah, so if you want to buy, if you're a trader, and then that, that's a different thing. You may just want to each time the market swing up by 5%, you want to take a quick profit because as a trader, you, you are into the mode of collectively collect 5% 5, 5 profit each time, but accumulatively, you'll make some money there. Um, so I do not know what's the contact. I think the starting point is very important that you have to position yourself very well that if you want to buy the Magnificent 7 now, are you an investor? And I think if you're an investor, you have to be very careful because when inflation starts to move up, uh, it means that if you buy 100 today, it may not move down a lot, but even it moves up by to $80 means that you're making a loss of 20%. So to me, it doesn't make sense anyway. Yeah, so right. not just, don't buy for the sake of buying, but with mm -hmm. a certain objective. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. That's then. So it's basically also weighing the risk, uh, yes. risk to reward the balance. All right. Okay, uh, there's another question on the US market uh, by Lily Low. Um, a question is, will AI era overcast the growth fear in US market? Will that uh, overcast the fear of the US market? Is that a question? Mm, yes. Yeah. Okay, let, when talk about AI, let me just talk about the last craze before the AI. So the AI craze started in beginning of 2023 when chat GPV was being introduced. So it had been lasting, lasting for the last one and a half year. Now, so what was the last craze before AI rally? Can you anyone remember what was the last craze? The last craze was, okay, not to stress you, Nixon, the last craze was EV. <laughs> yeah, when uh, uh, Tesla was trading at the uh, $1,000, yeah, yeah, before they do some share uh, action. Uh, and before the EV, what was the last craze? In every season, there's a lot of craziness in the market. Before EV, the last craze was NFT. Yeah, people talk about NFT, yeah. But now no one talk about NFT. And now hardly people talk about Tesla. So yeah, so what I'm trying to say here is that the big picture. Uh so yesterday I was saying that uh even tonight, I think the as invested, I think the moving forward, the very important thing to understand is the direction of inflation. Yeah, that's what I have to say. So you may find that AI is a craze right now, but if you look at the AI stocks. Uh, you just go and uh, maybe if you have chat GPT, what you can do is that you type in chat GPT, list me the top 10 market cap of AI chip making company. So they give you the top 10. But out of the top 10, NVIDIA is not doing that bad. The PE ratio now is about 65%, which is not that good also. It's a bit overpriced now. Uh, but other competitors, their PE ratio could be in a range of 200 times and 400 times. Um, so I would say that um, um, there are cycle in every sector. So AI also have cycle. So if I relate back to EV, uh, that was about one and a half year ago, I find that EV is, uh, the, the season have gone for the time being. But I would say that in the far future, EV and AI is still a long way. There's a long runway. But for the time being, they may have some 
heavy, heavy correction, which EV have done so, uh, it will take a few more years to build back up again. Yeah, but this few more years can be a long wait. Yeah, it's just like the dot com. Uh, dot com started in uh, the year 2000. And we waited for 11 years. So when did the Nasdaq seriously pick up? When did the e-commerce seriously pick up? It was in 2011. Dot-com busted in year 2000. We waited for 11 years in 2011. Finally, the physical space take place that well, I, I purchased thing from Shopee, Alibaba, Taobao. That was in 2011. Yeah, then the Nasdaq started to fly. But it took 11 years for this stagnation. So same thing for EV. We have seen a peak the last two years. It has dropped. But now the latest craze is all the AI. But mm -hmm. it seems to me based on the, not just NVIDIA, but other competitors, companies, their P ratio is between about 200, some 200, some 400 times. Then the Tesla, the PE ratio was 1,000 times. Yeah, just to give you some benchmark here. Um, I would have to sum this up is that every sector, there are some peak. They have the cycle. Um, but I would say that for EV and AI is the future of the world. But maybe not now. Now you have reached its peak. And I think I might focus will be for Asia at the moment. Where I'm seeing that a lot of fund flows are coming to Asia. That's what we discuss about. Uh, so Asia, I think, is a good bet. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thanks. I'm, I'm mindful of the time. I'm looking at the clock. So I know we, we want to target for 845 latest. Uh, maybe what we do is uh, the, there's one question. Uh, there's actually two, but I think I can collate that into one question on commodity before we move on to Asia, right? So the question on commodity will be, at this stage, do you still recommend to buy into commodities? And to add on to that, uh, another question was asking, uh, what's your view on silver or is it better to buy? Is it better to buy than go? So are we, should we still look at commodity right now? Is silver better than gold? Okay. Uh, okay, let me just touch on the commodity prices with this yes. example on uh, Ba Chow Mi. Yeah. yeah, so Ba Chow Mi, before COVID, I could see Ba Chow Mi at about 350 in our hawker center or my food court or Kupitiam. But today, all the Ba Chow Mi is about $5, 550 Yeah, so you got to ask yourself, uh, when we order Ba Chow Mi, you know, uh, in the next two and five years down the road, do you think this bar chow me at 550 is going to maintain at 550 or maybe it's going to reach $6 in two to five years down the road? So you just got to ask uh, students or men on the street, what do they think the bar chow me two to five years down the road? And I think most of them will say maybe it's going to price at 650 or even $7. So all of us have this understanding that uh, all these are commodities prices. Yeah, bar chow me, there's, there's a hot inside, there's noodles, there's wheat inside, make the noodles, there's flour. And all these are commodities, and commodities, therefore, over the last two years, I say commodities are buy, and it's still buy. Yeah. So, yes, but between gold and silver, uh, I think I don't want to elaborate too much. I did produce a YouTube video about last month, look out for the gold and silver. So, my study is that gold and silver move in tandem together, but first, gold will move first, historically. And I can say that because gold and silver is... Uh, thousands of years of history here. And what I saw here is that gold move first usually, then after that, silver will move up subsequently. But I do notice a trend for silver when it moves, the magnitude of this uptake is much more than the gold. So I think you get my hint very clear is that I think silver have moved. And when I produced that video, the time silver was about $26. I think today silver is $30. So silver, I think is catching up with gold. And there's a reason why, but I don't think I want to elaborate because we have other questions to take on. Right. So do right. watch the video if you can. Right. Okay. Um, let's move on to Singapore market, right? So I think I can collate this question to uh, if I were to look at the Singapore market, which sector should I be looking at? And would you recommend uh, buying SPID now or when STI breaks 3,400? That means when, it, when the bull run is confirmed. Okay. I think immediately when you ask me this question about the fund flow, uh, which segment should you buy? Uh, means that it's already, we're seeing some result here is the banking sector. It's really moving and you got to ask yourself why. And I never thought about it before, but uh, as the bank move, 
when I present a topic, I kind of I begin to realize that what the bank move is because of fund flows. Uh, fund flows coming into Singapore, into Asia, and Singapore is the banking hub of Asia. So naturally, when ASEAN boom, Singapore banking sector will boom as well because fund flow naturally will come to Singapore. So therefore, you see that our three banks has been on the high side. So I think we'll stay in this way uh, since my proposition is that I would like to accumulate Singapore, ASEAN, and I think we're just at the beginning of the move. As the world get a bit more challenging, the world of the the money of the world are always looking for a greener pasture. So they have, and to me, it's very clear that they have identified that ASEAN is the greener pasture. And look at how uh, the big boys in US have accumulated cash. But in the same time, where I just shared that the Amazon are investing further of nine billion dollars into Singapore market, and two billion into uh, that's Microsoft. This month, they announced that they are investing into Malaysia market. So it's very clear sign to to me that all this uh, MNC are coming into ASEAN. Yeah. So and banking sector, I think should remain uh uh quite supported moving forward. Just based on this idea. Yeah. What about the REITs? The REIT sector. Okay, the REIT sector um is. Okay, if you happen to buy REITs and you have capital gain, I would say that you're quite lucky. Yeah, because when you have to understand about REITs, REITs is never about capital gain. But I know that investors, sometimes they happen to buy and the market appreciate. So I would say that you're quite lucky because you managed to cash at the range low. So to understand about REITs is that we have to understand that we must come from a positioning of we are getting the dividend. So if you have capital gain, you're uh, quite fortunate. But what if you don't have capital gain, you buy the range high, the market start to fall, then the payout may not be able to cover your capital loss. Now, RITs, I do not quite favor. I know that Singapore is a big on RITs. Uh, um, I hope SGX can pardon me by saying this. <laughs> so, <laughs> now, uh, RITs do have some beauty there, so be selective for the RITs. Why? Because with a higher interest rate to come, and RITs do have gearing as well, they do have borrowings, uh, their profit margin is really quite thin, by the way. So if they still have to pay a lot to uh, uh, pay pay off their interest payment, and that will actually affect the payout. Uh, so be selective for REITs. I think REITs is still a good uh, sector that you should get in. Uh, but understand in the rising interest rate environment, select those REITs where they have lower borrowings. I think that's important. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, I do. I know we don't have a lot of time. So uh, next will be outside of Singapore. So maybe I'll just collate this question as one. So other than Singapore market, any other ASEAN market would you recommend? That's, that's one. And specifically, if you look at China and Hong Kong, would you recommend buying China and Hong Kong right now? And which one first? I mean, uh, if will Hong Kong recover first or China or, Ch or the other way around? I think I look at uh, China, Hong Kong as a, uh, a partnership here because I, I think the a lot of China company have listed their shares in Hong Kong. And Hong Kong, in terms of experience in raising funds, is definitely uh, uh, a light year ahead of uh, China. Yeah, But the most of the company listed in Hong Kong are the Chinese company. So you can take that as a partnership. Yeah. So when we buy the Hong Kong shares, we are also looking into the China shares listed in Hong Kong. Now, of course, if you want, you can buy the uh, Shanghai shares directly if you if you would love to. Uh, I would say that uh, they are at the low point. And what happened to uh, China over the last three years, uh, I know that it didn't sit well with many investors, but as an investor, I kind of like appreciate what China are doing. Uh, why? Because with the cleanup of the property sector, uh, I think that was in, since about 2021, right? A massive cleanup in property sector, I think as investors are very much welcome. Now for China, I think we have to look at it in two phase in their cleanup because we all understood that. I think based on Singapore itself in 1965, uh, even before that, uh, how we how we managed to become uh, one of the world top uh being the whole world is because of a clean system that we have. But it didn't come easy. Uh, you know the founding fathers have to do a lot of cleanup, all this and that. So I think China also subscribed to the idea. And there are two phases of what China have did. 
I think the first phase was that they uh they clean up the tigers and flies. Yeah, so I think that one is uh that was the first phase, right? The second phase started during COVID in 2001. They also clean up on the uh, middle uh, level people, which is the business uh, people, where they target on the property sector. And for property sector, it was very much heavy, uh, heavy leverage. Uh, so what they do is that the, uh, the developer uh, kind of, uh, you know the story, they leverage on, they make use of the retailer, yeah, the, the buyer. So I think the Chinese uh, system don't like that. And I think the cleanup is much welcome. And I think now China is much more conducive as an investor. As an investor, I think we do not want to put our money there and being uh, swindled away. But I think the environment is, uh, as an investor, I think are much more welcome and I look much forward to it. And of course, with the recent development, uh, I think the good news is that uh, BYD have overtook Tesla, being the number one car maker. And technology are there. They have an upper hand that the government are giving a lot of incentive to the uh, MNC, where US could not do that. Uh, so to me, that's welcome. So there's two levels you're looking at it. First, I think the whole system, the ecosystem is cleaner. And then number two is that the Chinese government are also focusing on the right thing, which is the technology that we're seeing that is uh, kind of overwhelm the US EV market right now. And that's just the first stage. So, but when you look at the stock market, China A50 or the CSI 300, now it's still at its low point. Yeah. So when it comes to risk, I don't think the risk is uh, uh, that great. Yeah. So I think, uh, therefore I say for Asia, it's a time to accumulate. Uh, I'm not saying buying, but accumulate means that you go slow. Uh, say, for example, if $100 to buy right now in a particular uh, country or stocks, you go slow, maybe buy 20. Get your finger wet. Because when you buy 20, uh, you have 100 by 20, then you are a bit more uh, attuned to what the company development. Yeah. So go and study about the company, what they do, uh, what's the development over the time. Then before you throw in another 20, then as time passes, you look at the development, you throw another 20. So you slowly average up. Yeah. So that's what I'm doing in uh, one of the Chinese company uh, right now. Yeah. So awesome. I slowly buy, average up along the timeline. As it showed me, proved to me that they can, they have new develop, development, I'll buy some more. Yeah. I've, yeah. I've, yeah. All right. Uh, thanks, Ron. I know we are past the time, but maybe one very last question. Uh, uh, the question just now was, besides Singapore, besides China, Hong Kong, uh, what other Asian market uh, do you recommend? And there's also a question of what about India? So let's, let's make that the last question. Okay. Uh, maybe... I will um, narrow down the India market. I know India and Japan market is the hottest in Asia, uh, but do also note that their currency are the weakest. Yeah, so if, uh, of course, Japanese uh, currency, you understood, right? Yeah, so you just look at the currency, you have uh, depreciated by uh, uh, not just one or two percent take point, but yeah, if uh, depreciated by a by, uh, good fraction, yeah. So is the India rupee. Uh, Sing dollar versus rupee or US dollars versus, versus rupee. Yeah. So now you can make a 60% gain, but if you're going to loss out on 40% on the currency, then uh, that's quite a high risk. And it seems to me that the Japanese yen is going to continue to be weakened and the rupee, I have no idea whether it's going to continue to weaken. So uh, I would say that uh, in that context of the currency risk, uh, being a outside investor, of course, if you are in India, you earn rupee. I think that's fine. But mm. uh, being a Singaporean, we earn in Sing dollar. I have to protect the yeah. currency risk. So that's what I'm saying. That uh, do take note of the currency risk. So I think India uh, still have a uh, upward momentum to go. I'm not exactly sure about uh, Japan, but what I'm seeing here is that currency risk is a big factor to consider. I would always like to start uh, at the low point because the low point, the upside potential is much greater. So you still can invest in Japan and uh, India. The momentum is still there. Uh, to sum it up is that you have to take care of the currency risk. All right. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Gong Hao. So now uh, allow me just uh, share a slide. Uh, again, uh, just to invite you to uh, give us feedback so that we can support this uh, series of webinar. And uh, we will get Kong Hao, invite Kong Hao back again soon uh, in, uh, for the next quarter.